My name is Catherine Valdi, and it's my privilege to serve on the University Lecture Committee this year. Thank you so much for coming out tonight for our first event of the season. Before we can begin, I just want to make a few brief announcements. Um, please turn off or silence all cell phones and pagers. I hope that you came prepared to ask questions as Mr. Kristoff will take questions after his lecture is finished tonight. For the question and answer section, please look for lecture committee members with microphones on the outer aisles of the room. Please line up and we'll send people up one at a time to ask your question. You may then head back to your seat as soon as you have finished. I am also excited to announce the rest of our fall lineup. We will be welcoming Dr. John Lawrence to discuss the medical crisis in Syria this Wednesday, October 2nd, John Ronson on October 16th, Holly Jacobs on October 21st, and former Iowa Supreme Court Justice Marcia Turnus on November 12th. Please see the Lecture Committee website for details about the time and locations of these events. Tonight, there are two groups that I would like to recognize. First, I want to extend a huge thank you to ECGPS, the Executive Council of Graduate and Professional Students, for their generous co-sponsorship that made this evening possible. Secondly, I would like to acknowledge RVAP, the Rape, Rape Victim Advocacy Program, as it is their 40th anniversary this year. And now, it is my pleasure to introduce Mr. Nick Kristoff. Mr. Kristoff graduated from Harvard College and studied law at Oxford University on a Rhodes Scholarship. He joined the New York Times in 1984, serving as a correspondent in Los Angeles, Hong Kong, Beijing, and Tokyo. He was later was associate managing editor of The Times. Since 2001, he has written an op-ed column for The Times, and his work has often focused on global health, poverty, and gender issues in the developing world. Nick is a two-time Pulitzer Prize winner and co-author of Half the Sky. So without further ado, please help me give a warm welcome to Mr. Nick Kristoff. Thanks very much. Thanks a lot, um, Catherine. And um, also thanks to so many of you who have been tweeting me for, it seems like weeks now, uh, welcoming me in advance. I appreciate the warm welcome. Um, and I also appreciate something else. You know, I kind of, as any journalist, I associate Iowa with um, January visits every four years. And so it was kind of wonderful to see that Iowa can be nice and warm and sunny and, and beautiful. Uh, who knew? <laughs> um, um, and um, so um, it's, uh, and I had the chance to talk earlier with some students. It really has been terrific to be uh, back out here. I, I was here actually right before the floods, uh, I think in 2007. And um, boy, a lot has happened since here. Um, and I hope you'll get your basement back soon. Um, now, people are always kind of um, curious that a uh, New York Times columnist and a man to boot should be writing so much about what we think of as women's issues uh, around the world. And so let me explain a little bit of how that came to pass. It, it was kind of an accident through, uh, through my reporting. And um, as you may know, um, half the sky comes from a a Chinese saying, somebody must know, how do you say half the sky in Chinese? Ban bian tian? Okay, very good. Um, and the, the idea for it really came when uh, my wife Cheryl and I were uh, living in China. Uh, that's Cheryl and me in, in Tiananmen Square um, a few months ago. And, <laughs> well, that wasn't very polite. <laughs> <laughs> is it really that obvious? Um, um, you know, one way of gauging that is that our son Gregory, who is on my shoulders there, Gregory is now a, a college junior, which sort of goes to show how quickly kids grow up in just a few months. Um, so um, when <coughs> excuse me, uh, I'm um, I. I I'm just back from Syrian refugee camps, and I, I picked up um, something of a, a, a chest cold there, and I thought, oh, this must be some incredibly exotic disease, and I came home, and my daughter has exactly the same cough, so, uh, you know, I promise I'm not going to infect you with anything, with anything too exotic. Um, but when Cheryl and I were living in China, we began to see uh, what happens when you begin to invest on the basis of gender. And we saw it through something of an accident. Uh, we were 
writing about how there were so many girls who were dropping out of school basically because they were school girls. This is 1990, and uh, we, this girl here, her name was Dai Manju, and she uh, had to drop out. She was the brightest kid in her school, and she had to drop out for one of $13 in annual school fees. $13. She would hang out at the school gate. Um, the teachers loved her because she was so bright. They would give her extra pencils and notebooks, but she couldn't study for one of that $13. And so Cheryl and I were writing about this phenomenon, and we chose her as the poster child of this. We ran her picture three columns across the front page of the New York Times to write about it. And you can imagine what happened next. We were just deluged with letters from readers, mostly containing checks for $13, wanted to help her. Um, New York Times readers are incredibly generous in kind of very modest increments. <laughs> um, and, um, but we also got a wire transfer from one reader for $10,000 to help her. And we took all this money down, remember this is 1990, we took all this money down to uh, work out a deal with her principal, who's that man there. And basically the deal was that this money would be used to keep girls in school, who otherwise would have to drop out. And that as long as girls could maintain the grade, uh, they could stay in school. These girls were thrilled. For the first time, your academic prospects would be a function not of your chromosomes, but of your intellectual capacity. And then we called up the donor of the $10,000 to give him a report. And he was kind of surprised that we would call him up. And we explained, you just don't understand how far $10,000 will go in rural China. He kind of gasped and he said, $10,000? I only sent $100. Yeah, that, we gasped too at that point. Yeah, well it turns out that he had only attempted to wire $100, but the bank had had a little trouble with that decimal point. So we, we later figured that banker was probably put in charge of subprime mortgages, you figure? Uh, so, you know, we didn't know what to do. We, we couldn't imagine going back to these girls and saying, oh, sorry, it was all a banking error in New York. You know, at the end of the month or end of the quarter, they're gonna discover this error and you know, then you'll drop out of school. We couldn't do that. How many of you um, are studying journalism? Okay, well, be sure to like, close your ears for the next little bit <laughs> because what I did next was not hugely professional. I'm kind of embarrassed by it, but what I did was I called up the chief spokesman for the bank uh, in New York, and I explained exactly what had happened. Uh, they'd made this error. These girls were relying on it to get the first hope for education ever. And then I just sort of let slip the follow-up article I was working on. <laughs> you see where this is going? And I said, now, on the record, are you going to try to get that $9,900 back and force all these girls to drop out of school? Well, he didn't miss a beat. He said, on the record, under the circumstances, we're delighted to make a donation of the difference. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, let's give the bank a hand. They deserve it. <laughs> so that was 1990, and we visited periodically since then. And it's been fascinating to watch what happened. So Dai Manju herself became the first person in her family to graduate from elementary school, from middle school, from high school, then earned an accounting degree, uh, joined a large accounting firm in Guangdong province in the south, then started her own small accounting firm after about 10 years. So many other girls <coughs> uh, who otherwise would have been, you know, ended up dropping out and working in the, in the rice paddies or tending goats, ended up getting a great education and uh, earning money in ways that supported the entire community. The beneficiaries of this weren't just those girls, it really was the entire community. And so you go back now and I mean obviously all of China and all of Hubei province has hugely benefited in the interim. But you go to this area in the, in the Dabia Mountains and 
uh, this village, all, there are all these little clusters of villages, and this village is far and away better off than all these others around it, just because of one one-time banking error uh, 23 years ago. It's kind of a remarkable indication of what can happen when you invest in girls' education and then see the, this virtuous spiral of development unfold as a result. And so for Cheryl and me, you know, that was one of the initial epiphanies that kind of got us thinking in those terms. And the more we began to think in those terms, the more we began to see what is possible. And it was really ultimately that reporting uh, abroad and at home that led us to uh, the book and the documentary of, of Half the Sky. And I think one of the, um, the things that we came to see as we reported more uh, on uh, sexual violence, on trafficking, on all kinds of issues, we came to believe that the uh, central more, just as the, as the paramount moral challenge of the 19th century was slavery, and just as the paramount moral challenge of the 20th century was totalitarianism, that in this century, the central moral challenge, and I think for, for those of you who are students, really kind of the, the central cause of, of, of your times, is the uh, just profound gender inequity that is true in so much of the world. Today. And when we say that, I think people are skeptical and think that it kind of is, <coughs> is meant in a, in a kind of hyperbolic way. And it's not. Uh, let me, to explain, let me turn the tables on you and ask you a question. Are there more males or females in the world today? Um, let's, let's put it to a vote here. Um, anybody think there are more males in the world today? Um, I see a few hands. Um, and who thinks there are more uh, females in the world today? I'm afraid that first group was right. There are actually more males. Um, we think that there are more females because in the United States there are more females. Um, in, uh, in Europe there are more females. I bet among University of Iowa undergraduates, are there more females? Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, in, a, in an egalitarian society given equal access to food and, and health care, women live longer. So in an egalitarian society, there are more females. But the point is that in much of the world, sex discrimination isn't just about unequal pay or inappropriate comments or anything else. It's lethal. Um, this is a picture I took in, a, in an emergency feeding center in Ethiopia. You look at it, you see starvation. But what you need to know is that every kid in that feeding center was a girl. And uh, this girl's brothers, in fact, were doing just fine. And in much of the world, if you don't have enough food, then you feed your son and you don't feed your daughter. When your son is sick, you take him to the doctor. When your daughter is sick, you know, you kind of feel her forehead and say, let's see how you're doing tomorrow. And the upshot of that is differentials in mortality rates for boys and girls, uh, so that uh, girls are more likely to die. Um, and in recent years, on top of that, you've had the spread of ultrasound, and you've had sex-selective abortion, which has amplified the, the existing problem. And so, depending on what demographer does the math, you have somewhere between 50 and 120 million females missing worldwide. 50 and 120 million. And that is why there are more males than females worldwide. To slice it and dice it a different way, um, in any 10 year period, you have more girls who are discriminated against to death than all the people who died in all the genocides of the 20th century. Just a stunning figure. And when you think of it in those terms, I think it's easier to see why this would be uh, the central moral challenge of the century. But that's, if you will, the, the moral um, theme that, that came through in our reporting. The other thing that really struck us is putting aside the issue of injustice. If you simply look at where you can get 
leverage to bring about change on all the kinds of issues we each care about, on global poverty or domestic poverty, on um, climate change, on civil conflict and terrorism, then there are no silver bullets. But time and again, the area where you can get the most bang for the buck is to educate girls and to bring those educated women into the formal labor force and into society and see the same kind of a, a virtuous spiral of development as happened in that village in, in Hubei province in China with Dai Manchu. Uh, to put it another way, uh, women and girls aren't the problem, uh, but the solution. And there, uh, there are any number of reasons for that. One has to do simply with fertility, though. If you educate a boy, on balance, he'll have fewer children. Uh, but it's a pretty marginal effect. When you educate a girl, it has a very dramatic effect on birth rates. And so many social issues are entangled with very high birth rates. I mean, quite aside from environmental pressures, uh, carbon emissions, uh, simply the, the, this having a youth bulge in the population is one of the things that correlates most highly to civil conflict and terrorism and violence there. One of the ways you address it over the long term, obviously, is educate those girls, bring down the birth rate so you don't have that kind of a, a destabilizing youth bulge. It's not a quick impact solution, but over time it really can make a difference. Um, well, so if this is indeed the central moral challenge, what might an agenda look like uh, to make a difference? One of the issues that I think has to be much higher on the agenda, internationally and domestically, is human trafficking, which at its extreme really is a modern form of slavery, and sexual violence generally. Um, I became, uh, Cheryl and I both became interested in this when we were living abroad in, in Cambodia, and this really, this really felt absolutely like modern slavery. These are girls in a Cambodian brothel. They were kidnapped in rural areas. They're locked up in the brothel. They don't get paid. Um, and typically, they, the big difference from, old, from 19th century slavery is that they're dead of AIDS by their 20s. Um, and when um, w one of the things that that we wrote about in, in Half the Sky, and um, that, uh, uh, that created some controversy in journalistic circles was I ended up buying uh, two girls from their brothels. Uh, this girl, uh, Stray Net, I paid $150 for her, and uh, Stray Mom in the, in the white blouse there with the, with the blue uh, line going down, uh, paid just over $200 for her. And it's, it was a long, protracted um, uh, process that, uh, that we write about. Um, I'm still in touch with both of them. But the thing that really shook me was when I bought them, I got written receipts for both of them. Written receipts, I mean, it's like buying a car, taking title to a car or a boat. When you get a written receipt for buying a human being in the 21st century, something really is profoundly wrong. Okay, say it's a heart problem. Where do you turn? The University of Iowa has the widest range of heart and vascular expertise in the state. A team of specialists reviews your case, considers every option, and offers the country's most innovative solutions, including a remarkable, minimally invasive surgery performed through just a few small incisions, all to get you back to life sooner. Where you go does matter. We have a certain way of doing things. You'll see it in the determination of our students, in the classroom and on our fields, in the collaboration among our faculty that lead to great innovation and change, in the vision of our writers, artists, and doctors. Bringing the world to Iowa and Iowa to the world. It's the Hawkeye way. I think there's a tendency to think that, oh, you know, it's terrible what happens 
halfway around the world in Cambodia uh, or India, uh, Pakistan. And it's true that the places where modern sexual slavery where trafficking tend to be the worst are countries like Cambodia, India, Nepal, Pakistan, Bangladesh, uh, Malaysia, um, to some degree Thailand and Burma. But we don't have, but we also have a huge trafficking problem right here at home. And we don't have the moral authority to tell other countries to clean up their act unless we do much more right here. And um, I think there's a misperception sometimes that trafficking in this country is basically about foreign women smuggled into the US. That is indeed a problem, but I'd say that the bigger part of the problem in terms of the numbers and in terms of, uh, especially in terms of the really young girls, that the bigger problem is domestic, homegrown girls. Uh, and typically what happens is this is a uh, girl growing up in a, in a troubled home, in a, in a low-income neighborhood. It's, this isn't universal, but I'd say this is the most common scenario. Maybe um, her mama's boyfriend is hitting on her. Um, there's a lot of distrust there. She runs away at 12 or 13, goes to the bus station or the mall, and the only person looking out for her in that kind of situation is the pimp. And he gives her a shoulder to cry on, he buys her a meal, and she thinks, oh, you know, at last I found somebody who understands me. And then uh, three days later, he's selling her to, um, you know, seven or ten men a day and uh, tattooing her to put his brand on her like a, a cattle owner might, might brand his cattle and warning her that if she ever runs away, he'll kill her. And there's this misperception uh, I think one of the great problems here is there's misperception because we see these 14-year-old girls out in the street wearing inappropriate clothing and they're, you know, they're, they don't trust police, they don't trust anybody, and we think that they are completely, you know, partners with the pimps. And that is just a complete misunderstanding of that relationship. The pimps are utterly abusive and controlling and manipulative. It's not to say that these girls are you know, being chained to the radiator somewhere. Um, but uh, you could not have a more violent and manipulative control. And plus these girls are, um, you know, they're really young. And it is so aggravating that the police response is to arrest the girls who were really the, the victims here. Um, and that is beginning to change. And I think we need to put more pressure on police and on prosecutors to see this not as a kind of a public nuisance issue, but to see these girls as victims and to go after uh, the pimps in particular, and, and to some degree the Johns. If you have fewer Johns, then you're gonna have less demand and you're gonna have fewer girls arrested. One of the things that really just, um, just outraged me was um, uh, there was a case in Michigan, um, a, I forget if she was 15 or 16, um, but a um, girl went missing and her family was looking all over for her. And uh, do you know Backpage.com? It does a lot of prostitution advertising. So her family looked for her on Backpage and they found her picture. They found her being advertised on Backpage. So they called the police um, and the police, uh, uh, I guess, triangulated and found where the cell phone signal was coming from. It was coming from a motel. Uh, and they raided it, and there was a pimp who was holding this girl and another one. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, the police arrested the pimp, but they also arrested these two girls. And, um, you know, as long as one is arresting these girls, and of course you're not going to be able to build trust with them and, and get them to help in the prosecution of the pimps. We need to kind of rethink how we approach this issue. Um, the, um, the other issue um, that I think we, that is related to it is, is sexual violence. And there too, there's a lot we can do on, uh, you know, on campuses uh, and in the US as a whole. Um, I was, um, uh, I met with the uh, RVAP uh, folks uh, 
uh, earlier this afternoon, and um, I was just struck by the by the numbers here at Iowa. That uh, so in the last in the last year there were 56 rapes uh, reported on campus, um, and which kind of surprised me, shook me. I mean, I'm sure the uh, the number of reports is way below the number of actual incidents. And I think we still, as a society, kind of haven't wrapped our heads around the way rape typically happens in a situation like this. That, you know, if it's a stranger rape, then we, then we kind of get it. But uh, so often where it's a issue of consent, that, um, you know, the, the girl is, um, has, uh, is, you know, been drinking with this guy, or she's gone to a party, um, and she's, you know, started making out with some guy, but then she's fallen unconscious, or she's, at that point, uh, tried to say, no, I want to stop here, and he um, forces things further. You know, that's the way so many of the, so much of the sexual violence happens, and that is what we still haven't figured out that, you know, that no means no in that kind of context. I think we have to do a much better job uh, in trying to make that clear to men and women uh, alike. More broadly, kind of domestic violence, you know, um, one of the things that really, uh, earlier this year, um, I don't know if you, if you know about this, you saw this, there was a, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a country where we have so much domestic violence, so many ex-girlfriends being, um, being attacked by, by ex-boyfriends. This is a, um, the ex-girlfriend mannequin, which was uh, being sold on Amazon. Uh, and it was meant for target practice. And the sales pitch was that when you shoot it, it bleeds. You know, in a country where we have so many women being killed by ex-boyfriends, we want to market this. And um, indeed, Amazon, after protests, did take it down. But to me, it just reflected the kind of the broad, you know, how much work we have to do in kind of building sensitivity and raising this issue uh, much more broadly. I think we still don't get this issue. Um, another issue that I think has to be much higher on the agenda is reproductive health. Um, and again, I'm speaking both globally and domestically. Um, I've seen a lot of really really tragic things in my travels around the world, but I think the one that just breaks my heart more than almost any other is a, a childbirth injury called an obstetric fistula. Uh, have, you, have you heard of it? Does that ring a bell? I think some of you are not. It's, uh, um, it, it typically happens when a woman is in obstructed labor and needs a C-section, um, doesn't get it, um, and it, uh, the fetus becomes stuck. Gives, leads to internal injuries, leave her uh, incontinent. And um, it, it also disproportionately happens uh, to, to, in a first pregnancy, especially with a teenage girl who is really pregnant before her body is, before her pelvis is really ready to deliver. And um, so that's what happened here. This, uh, this is Mahabuba, who is an Ethiopian. At age 12, she was married to a 60-year-old man. She was not consulted. Um, she became pregnant. She uh, tried to deliver alone in the bush. Uh, the, the fetus was stuck, um, eventually died. Uh, she um, then suffered these internal injuries and I mean, there's, there's, no, there's no elegant way of putting this. She, um, she's leaking uh, urine and feces through her vagina uncontrollably. Uh, she stinks. Um, she also has nerve damage in her legs, both legs, foot drop, so she can't walk, she can't even stand up. The villagers think that because she stinks like this, they think she's been cursed by God and they put her in a hut at the edge of the village, and they take off the door of the hut so the hyenas will get her that night. 
Mahabuba is also just the, the strongest, toughest person you can imagine. And um, when the hyenas come, there's a stick in the hut. And so she can't stand, but she takes a stick, she shouts at them, she waves it around her head, she fends them off all night. The next day at dawn, the hyenas slink away, and she knows that there's an American missionary who lives just over 30 miles away. She sets off crawling, and she crawls all day. Uh, the evening still isn't close. She pulls herself into a tree, spends a night in the tree so the hyenas won't get her. In the morning, lets herself down and continues crawling, arrives half dead at the door of this missionary, and um, who can immediately tell, basically, because she's leaking waste, because she stinks, because she's recently gone through childbirth, that she has a, a fistula, takes her to a hospital in the Ethiopian capital, Addis Ababa, uh, where she gets a $450 surgery to repair that fistula, to get her life back. And then she's going through a physical therapy to deal with the nerve damage in her legs, and the hospital is understaffed. They ask her to help out. They realize that she's really smart. And so they give her more and more responsibilities, and she does really well. And so she is now a nurse at that same hospital. You know, it's a wonderful example of how one can empower people so you're need, dealing not only with injustices, but also really give them the, the tools to make a difference in their lives and other people's lives. Um, now, how does one deal with this more broadly? You know, the, um, in this country, we tend to think of childbirth as this kind of wonderful, joyous occasion. In much of the world, just about the most dangerous thing a woman can do is to get pregnant. And uh, in Niger, um, in West Africa, a woman has something like a one in eight lifetime risk of dying in childbirth. There are no easy, simple solutions to this, and you know, part of it is empowering women, not least so that they can go to a hospital alone, to a clinic alone, uh, when they need to deliver and not need a man's consent or a man to take them. Um, but one thing we really could do is support more access to family planning. Uh, if the number of pregnancies, there are 220 million women worldwide who want access to family planning who can't get it. 220 million. Um, if, for that Cotter, if they had only half as many pregnancies, they would only have half as many uh, deaths in childbirth. And yet, one of the really unfortunate things about the political polarization in this country is that because reproductive health has been so toxic over abortion policy, that even though by and large there is, uh, for the most part, agreement on contraception, I mean, not least because one of the most effective ways of reducing the number of abortions is to provide more family planning, um, but it has been impossible for left and right to agree to try to bridge that, that gap in in uh, unmet need for contraception, that 220 million women who, who want it. And we can do so much of a better job there in ways that are, that would really make a, a huge difference worldwide. And it's so frustrating that um, it's kind of political um, distrust here that is making it harder to meet that, that need worldwide.
Another thing that we can do um, is, um, and it makes sense to talk about it at a, at, a, at a university, is education. There are no silver bullets in making a difference, but whether you're talking about poverty at home or poverty around the world, I think the best escalator out of poverty is education. And the commonality between Tanzania and Chicago is that kids who were poor and most need that escalator are least likely to get access to an effective school and effective teachers that, that might actually work and take them out. Um, um, and um, um, this is a, uh, this is one of my favorite uh, stories. This is a girl called Beatrice, uh, Beatrice Bira. She was a Ugandan girl. She's nine years old in this picture. And her parents did not send her to school because she was a girl. And they thought, oh, she can fetch firewood, she can fetch water, she can look after her younger siblings. Yeah, she's a girl. She doesn't really need to learn how to read. Well, do you know the group um, Heifer International, Heifer Project? So um, the, um, uh, there was a church in Connecticut that got six goats through Heifer one, one Christmas, and one of those ended up with Beatrice's parents. And they sold the milk, and they used that and well, they had a bit of a nudge from Heifer, too. Uh, they, so they used that to send uh, Beatrice to school. They used the milk money to send Beatrice to school. And she turned out to be really just a brilliant student. She rocketed to the top of the class all during middle school and high school. She's um, earning, doing really well on nationwide examinations. And um, uh, then uh, becomes the first person in her village to go abroad uh, to study and ends up graduating from Connecticut College. Isn't that cool? That's Beatrice. Isn't that cool? Uh, this is her at her graduation party. And she said, um, she's the, uh, she said there that I'm the luckiest girl in the world, and it's all because of a goat. There are a couple of skeptical questions that I think people sometimes have, and let me try to address uh, those. And one is the question of whether it's really possible to make a difference. And I think there are a lot of people who are troubled by poverty at home or abroad, but are also frustrated by corruption. And just by how tough, I mean, how there are these cycles of poverty that really are difficult to get people out of. It becomes a vortex. And um, uh, so they just kind of doubt whether it can, it can make a difference. Now, let me just say that, you know, there is something real to that skepticism. Uh, it's harder to make a difference than it sometimes seems. And the corruption issue is real. The ineffectiveness issue is real. It's harder than it looks. Um, anybody who has traveled around the developing world has seen um, wells that have been put in, for example. Uh, considerable cost, but there isn't maybe a system to sustain the wells. Um, to keep them maintained. And so the washers tend to wear out after a couple of years. And if there isn't a system of repairs put in place, then you have this investment that is lost and then everybody goes back to drinking from the creek and their kids end up dying again. Um, and yet, I guess the answer to that is anybody who has traveled around has also seen programs where wells were put in and um, there was a system it was a smart system to, to keep it sustainable, to keep it repaired. And then they could go on for 15, 20 years uh, or more, and the child mortality in those villages dropped substantially. Um, I also think we're really getting smarter and better at figuring out how to make a difference. And partly that's, it's not that we're kind of marching in a community and saying, okay, here's what we're gonna do. And it's much more about getting local ownership of problems, listening to people about what they need. Um, there's much more uh, use of randomized control trials to really measure what will work and at what cost. The, the, there have been so many business people who have moved into these issues, and they really brought with them a sense of metrics and evaluation and rigor that has been really useful for the field. Um, and for example, in, in the world of, uh, of education, uh, the, um, one of the most cost-effective ways of getting um, more kids 
uh, in school isn't building more bricks and mortar schools and it's not subsidizing uniforms or anything else we might think of. It's something we, it tends not to be on our minds. Um, it's deworming kids. You know, we don't think of deworming because most kids in the U.S. aren't going to have intestinal parasites. Um, but in much of the world, school kids do, and the result is that they're anemic, uh, they're more likely to be sick, and they're, um, they miss a lot of school. And this is something you can address and resolve with, usually with one pill, something called albendazole, uh, once a year typically. It costs about five cents per child and dramatically reduces absenteeism. So, and by the way, I should say that when I first became aware of this, I thought, you know, that's, that's remarkable what one can do in, in Kenya or Uganda. It, I went back and it turns out that the Rockefeller Foundation dewormed American kids in the South where there were a lot of intestinal parasites in the year, in, basically in the years around World War I, between 1910 and 1920. And there are these old results that show that in, in the U.S. it had this remarkable impact on American school children when they de were dewormed and their teachers saying, oh, now they can, you know, finally study and they have so much more energy and they're missing class left. Well, you know, the same thing is, is true um, internationally. Um, and, um, and I'd say that domestically, uh, you know, as, as I said, the, the way you can make a difference in domestic poverty, um, it's education too, but I think it's evidence is overwhelming that it's early interventions. And that one of the reasons why the war on poverty in the U.S. hasn't been more successful is we started too late. And that the place where you get the maximum bang for the buck is very, very early interventions, beginning in pregnancy uh, through two or three years, and then, you know, then indeed pre-K as well. But the earlier the intervention, the more likely you are to have an impact and to break these cycles of poverty. And the evidence on this is just remarkably robust. And it's kind of heartbreaking that we have this evidence and don't act on it. Um, and I guess the other way in which we sort of psych ourselves out, and I'll, I'll, I'll leave you with this, and then maybe we can take some questions and comments, but um, has to do with the question of, the very basic question, why should I care? Um, one answer to that is that if you've uh, seen these girls in a Cambodian brothel who were basically locked up there until they die of AIDS, you don't ask that question. Uh, if you... Uh, seen a, uh, a girl like Beatrice who desperately wants to go to school um, and can't afford it because of lack of, you know, goat milk money. <coughs> um, then you don't ask that. But the other thing that has really struck Cheryl and me is that aside from those reasons, there are also huge internal reasons, if you will, for getting engaged. When we wrote Half the Sky, and when we shot the documentary of PBS, we were focusing often on groups of Americans who were getting engaged in these issues. And typically they would begin and they'd be kind of reluctant because they had a million things going on and they were busy, but it felt like the right thing to do. And they thought it'd be a sacrifice, but okay, it's worth it. And then as they got more engaged, and especially when it was more than just writing checks, but they really did see the products of, the, of, of what they were doing, then it became hugely fulfilling uh, to them. And, um, for the next book that Cheryl and I are working on, we've been kind of engaged in looking at some of the neuroscience uh, of this. And it's kind of remarkable. There are these pleasure centers in the, in the brain, um, among them the nucleus accumbens. Um, and these are things that respond to really primal pleasures. They respond to good food, to sex, um, drugs, trying to target them directly. That's how, that's how addiction models happen. Um, and you can also see them um, that when you, when you give to a cause, when you get engaged in a cause larger than yourself, they light up. And Cheryl and I actually went in a brain scanner and um, watched our own tapes of our own brains as we were receiving money and as we were giving. And it's just remarkable to see this very primal center uh, respond to to, to, to helping others, to supporting others. They're really, um, 
Um, there really is something, there really are real benefits of finding fulfillment and meaning when you get engaged in this kind of cause larger than yourself. And I think that we also, in that kind of a situation, that we find a measure of perspective about our own lives. Um, and of course, that is something that universities are supposed to provide as well, provide some perspective on where we are. Let me leave you with um, the story of a friend of mine, um, a young American woman who was a uh, aid worker in Congo and in Sudan, among other places. Um, I met her in Sudan, where she was an aid worker in Darfur, and uh, she was incredibly tough. Um, she never showed weakness, uh, never saw her show fear, uh, and then she was back over Christmas vacation here in the U.S. in her grandmother's backyard, and she totally lost it. She was just, just fell apart. She's weeping in her grandmother's backyard. You know what it was? Her grandmother had set up a bird feeder, and my friend was there in the backyard thinking about, about all that she had seen, and her eyes fell on that bird feeder, and she thought how just unbelievably lucky she was to uh, be born in a country where even in tough economic times, we basically have enough food and clothing and housing, and even have enough extra to help wild birds get through the winter. She sort of thought about it in that context and thought about her good fortune and, and the responsibility that comes with it. In the same way, at the end of the day, the fact that we are right here, right now, um, truly, in a global perspective, means we've won the lottery of life. And when you have won the lottery of life, then there is some responsibility that goes with that to give back. Uh, and so I invite you to join this effort, find your own niche within it, and together I think we can help change the world just a little bit. Thank you very much, and I'd be delighted to take questions. Tradition. Mm -hmm. Ambition. Exploration. Inspiration. You feel it when you step on campus at the University of Iowa. The energy and pride of students inspired by our history. And excited about our future. When you join the Hawkeye family, you're a part of it all. Be a part of it. Be a part of it. Be a part of it. Be a Hawkeye. Hi, well, I have a question from you uh, that arose from this. First, I'd like to know, how do you get these women to tell you their stories? How do they open up to you, and why do they open up to you? Uh, I'm sorry, which stories was that? So, the, especially the story about um, the woman who crawled to the embassy. Uh -huh. How did you find her? How did you find out about that? And all of these different stories, um, they're hidden in Connecticut and things like that. How do they how do they come to your attention, and why do they tell you their stories? Why are they how do they become comfortable with you as a journalist? You know, it's a. Um, I mean, it's a great question. I mean, I guess what I would say is that in my reporting, I found that the way to get people to care about these issues is through individual stories. So I put enormous effort into trying to find the most compelling story. And in particular, the, the thing that really struck me was um, when I first began to write about Darfur, um, I felt, you know, I was going off and I was writing about these villages of massacres and 
terrible things going on, and it felt like my columns were just disappearing without a ripple. And then I came back in New York, and I don't know if you remember this, it, um, but at the same time, there were uh, two red-tailed hawks in New York, uh, pale male, and I can't remember what the female was, and they were living in a, in a condo right on the edge of Central Park, and the condo thought that they were leaving too many bird droppings, and so broke up their nest, and we had two homeless red-tailed hawks in Central Park, and all of New York was like outraged over two homeless hawks. And I thought, how is it that I can't generate the same amount of outrage over hundreds of thousands of people being slaughtered as people feel over two homeless hawks? And that led me to um, work in social psychology and in neuroscience about what makes us connect. Things. And it turns out that it's basically about stories. And so the upshot is if I want to write about an issue, I go out and I try to find the most compelling story I can. And um, I will you know, go village to village, person to person, trying to find that story that is going to get Americans to spill their coffee in the morning, to care about this issue. And once you tell that story, then you can throw in the statistics and the broader situation and move people. Um, so I spend an enormous amount of time trying to, find, trying to find those. And, you know, especially in cases of sexual violence where there's a huge stigma um, or there may be danger for a woman to, uh, to tell her story, it's remarkable how brave they are in telling these stories. And, I, in particular, I remember um, a woman in Darfur um, who had been an incredibly brave woman. She, she'd been out with her younger, uh, her younger sister, and uh, the Janjaweed militia was approaching, and she sent her 14-year-old sister, Halima, running back to the camp, and then she made a diversion of herself so that the Janjaweed would, would, would go after her and not her sister. And they caught her, eight of them gang raped her. Uh, they beat her half to death. Uh, and then she told me her story. And I wanted to really, I wanted to use it, but I wanted to make sure that I really had her consent. There is a perception that drugs and sex trafficking are linked in that drugs are extensively used by sex traffickers to manipulate women and girls into sex trafficking. How true is this perception? And if it is true, what can we do? as a collective society to prevent the usage of that tool. Say that again. The last part? The, the, first part the, perception is that the perception is that drugs and sex trafficking are linked and that traffickers use it as a tool to manipulate women okay. into sex slavery. Um, the question, so um, drug trafficking, sex, tra sex trafficking tend to be linked to some degree uh, and so in the uh, in the case of one of the girls that there that I bought in Cambodia, um, Sri, uh, Sri Mom, uh, the brothel had got her addicted to methamphetamine, for example, um, and that was a way of controlling her. You also see that domestically, some pimps uh, do that uh, as well. But um, in general, there tends to be some divergence, and my understanding of kind of what happened historically is that. Uh, after there was the big crackdown in the 1970s and 1980s on, um, on drugs and drug trafficking, then you had a lot of people who had been in drug trafficking who looked at the penalties and the risks and decided that sex trafficking would be a lot safer. Essentially, because you know, if you go into drug trafficking, then there's a good chance you're going to be shot by another drug dealer, um, and at some point you're going to get arrested and sent off for a long time. In contrast, if you go into sex trafficking, then the pimps aren't shooting each other, um, and there's very little chance that the prosecutors will go after you. The prosecutors will arrest the girls, but they don't really go after the pimps. And so it's just much safer and incredibly lucrative. And so there was this, that was a time when people went into sex trafficking uh, as opposed to um, uh, to drug trafficking. It's true that there are a lot, of, a lot of gang activity where people are involved you know, in both, but not always a, cl not always a close uh, link between them. And last question. Thank you. 
Um, you mentioned uh, a lot of aspects of, you know, cultural backlash when we see a different um, side on how improvement can happen. And as somebody who grew up in both less privileged parts of the world and living in more privileged parts of the world, I see there's a dichotomy between two extremes where journalists can really make a difference. On one hand, there is conservative backlash when there's change, but then because of wrong journalism, there is also aspects of slum tourism and, you know, like Western condescension, and the two really spiral downwards and make it very difficult for somebody like me who has seen both sides and trying to make the bridge. I just end up losing both communities. So how do you deal with that? Um, you know, I think this, is, this relates to kind of the broader question of how one brings about uh, cultural change when you have practices that are embraced by a community that regards it as their culture or their faith, um, and in any case are kind of wary of outsiders um, telling them what to do. And one example is girls' education in Afghanistan. Another example is uh, female genital mutilation. Um, there, in the case of FGM, um, I think you had a, a really instructive failure. Uh, since the 1970s, you had a, really a global effort to uh, combat FGM. It used to be called female circumcision. It was rebranded as female genital mutilation. Um, and you had conferences held all over uh, to discuss it. Uh, you had laws passed in country after country uh, to prosecute uh, either parents who cut their daughters or the practitioners who were cutting girls. Uh, in Guinea, uh, it now can be punished by life imprisonment to, uh, to, to cut a girl's genitals in that way. And yet all this international effort had approximately zero impact. And indeed, it did create kind of the backlash that you're talking about. I remember one Sudanese uh, Daya, the woman who does the, the cutting, she was saying to me, this is our faith. This is our culture. What business is it of Americans whether we cut our daughters, whether we circumcise our daughters? And, you know, that's, that's a fair question. And it seemed to me that on balance, the way to make a difference there isn't to pass tougher laws and isn't for outsiders to march in and tell everybody, don't cut your daughters, don't circumcise your daughters, um, but rather is to empower the local agents of change and give them the megaphones and give them the support. And um, that has been happening. And so there are some organizations that really have been uh, working against FGM. Um, in, in our book, we, um, we talk about an amazing woman called Edna Adan, a Somali woman who runs a maternity hospital. And she's a passionate, um, and she, because she's Somali herself, because she was cut herself as a girl, she has the wherewithal to convince Somalis that this is not in the Quran, this is not part of Islam, you don't need to cut your daughters. And she has far more persuasive capacity than any number of Americans. You know, likewise in Afghanistan, as I said, when Americans embrace girls' education, that makes local communities, Pashtun areas, somewhat wary of it. And it's so much more effective when it's local imams who are being the advocates for this, and we, you know, we support those people. That that can have a powerful impact, uh, and I think we need to figure out more effective ways of empowering local advocates rather than uh, being um, the change makers ourselves. And um, with that, uh, thank you very much for having me here. It was a great pleasure. Keep up the great work.